Welcome to the second episode of Founders Only. My name is Ron Bate Young, your host, and this is a podcast made by founders for founders. And again, if you're not familiar with who I am and what we've been doing, Founders Only is technically the sequel of the Hustle Share podcast that's been going on for, you know, four years now, which talks about Filipino founders and technically that's sharing their hustle. Now, in this episode, is very, very special because I got my brothers from the very popular app and the Sunicorn, Kumu. And we'll be joined by the two co-founders that they have, which is Roland Ross and obviously Rexy Dorado. Um, these are the guys that literally made this startup what it is now. And they, they went very candid because number one, we caught up um, on how they're doing. Kumu went through a very uh, high phase at the start of around 2021. And in 2022, they went through a rough patch. So they really came clean on how, what they did when they had to let people go, when they had to optimize for profitability and all of these things. And then they also shared a lot of tips on how their dynamic is as co-founders and how they're able to work together, which you should know because again, you don't really get to see them talk about these things uh, very candidly. And we were also joined by our Hustle Share and Founders Only premium member that got a chance to ask them their dynamics of how they make their marriage work and how they were able to, you know, scale and go through the balance of being stressed and how they cope with the difficult life that startup does. And you got to stay till the very end because they chose a very interesting top five where they both picked their top five founders that you should watch out for, just like how we do it in every episode. And make sure you stick around and watch till the very end because this is going to be an amazing, amazing episode. Founders Only is brought to you by Paymongo, the payment gateway for business growth. Paymongo allows your business to accept online payments from customers through Visa, MasterCard, Gcash, GrabPay, Maya, online banking, Buy Now, Pay Later, and many more. All with just one online platform. Sign up for free at paymongo.com. Also brought to you by Capita. Capita's software solution seeks to automate the equity management process for startups, including workflows around cap tables, ESOPs, due diligence, and transactions. Sign up at capita.com to get started with your digital cap table, ESOP, award granting, and all things equity. Free for companies with under 25 stakeholders. And brought to you by GoTime Bank. GoTime Bank is owned by the Gokongwei Group, the same companies that brought you brands you love, like Cebu Pacific, Robinsons, True Value, Toys R Us, South Star Drug, and many more. GoTime Bank makes next level banking a breeze with its convenient account opening process. It takes less than five minutes to get started via the app. Plus, get your GoTime Bank Visa card at one of their kiosks for free. Download the GoTime Bank app today and experience the next level of banking. You may visit www.gotimebank.com.ph for more details. And Seedcap. Seedcap is a lending platform powered by UBX Philippines. With Seedcap, you can easily apply for a loan from 5,000 pesos up to 1 million pesos from the comfort of your home nationwide. Visit www.seedcap.ph, sign up and apply for a loan now. That's www.seekcap.ph. Take your business to new heights by seeking capital with Seedcap. Welcome to the second episode of Founders Only. We are back. And again, I'm very happy that these guys are joining me. This is what, their third time or fourth time now uh, with, with, with the podcast. Uh, I've started first. With Hustle Share, obviously the OG podcast with Roland Ross. Again, told me to zoom in, zoom out. I still to do it till now. So this is your fault. Everybody in my team knows zoom in. Um, I, I talk to to white guys, right? F, uh, zoom in when there's a fucking fire. That's what we talk about. And then I've had you guys on several playbooks. And the latest one that we talked about was Sunicorn Sessions mm. on Hustle Share. When it was still... A bull run <laughs> everywhere. But without further ado, let's welcome back. Again, first time in Founders Only. Yeah, this is very All right. Nice. Um, Mr. Roland Ross and Rexy Dorado of Gumu. Whoop, whoop. Hello, 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 Bo. Oh, <laughs> welcome back, evening. guys, and welcome to Founders Only. I, so, I yes. told you, we leveled up. Yeah, we leveled uh, yeah. Up this is up. like, holy crap. 
Very nice. Yep. And again, you, you guys got to be here. And again, thank you very much. This means a lot. I don't do know guys, if you know this. Do you guys own these seats? No, these it's shout out to or... Ikea, by the way. <laughs> okay. You got this for free. <laughs> you got it for free. Yeah. They From... sponsored us. They didn't want to put the… Uh, they didn't want to put… Um, can you use them? Rent. Can you bring them to other places? Yeah. Like yeah. If we, if we for go sure. So again, to shout out to Ikea. <laughs> set up a… Nice. But I love I, we got this on the same day. I don't know if you guys remember… On the day we did that meetup with Foxmont last last year, mm. when we all oh came nice, through. I pulled out real quick in the middle of the thing, because Ivy and I had to go to IKEA and get this stuff. Nice, yeah. So again, I was really nice. Looking, I was just looking around at IKEA for for things <laughs> so that we can use at events, and I'm yes. like, whoa, this is perfect. We got you. We can we can get this up. So again, thanks for for being here. It means a lot. Especially that this is my birthday. So thank you so much. Hey, happy, happy birthday, birthday man. Today. <laughs> yes. Today, today. Happy yes. birthday to <laughs> you. <laughs> thank you so much. But yeah. again, guys, we it's been been forever. 25, 26. <laughs> 35. I'm, 30, I'm oh, 35. Wow. 35 now. Hey. <laughs> That's what's up. So okay, I, let us go straight to the jugular here. It's been forever. It's been a rough, rough, rough. 12, and 12 plus months because when we were just talking about this last year or two years mm. ago, it was a bull run or it was a tail end of the bull run. There were unicorns everywhere. Everybody was like high valuations. Walk us through what's been, ha- has it been like the last time we did a podcast together? Rexy. Well, well, okay. And what Rome month Rome. was that? Yeah. When did we, when did we last? Q1. Time? I remember this is Q1. Q1, Q1 2022. 2022. Yes. Ooh, okay. That was like right before right? the tight. That was <laughs> just, <laughs> that was literally right before all hell broke loose. Correct. So they, uh, I usually talk about the black swan email that Sequoia had sent. Oh shit. Yes. That I was around it. exactly that month. What was um, in the email? Just walk, walk everybody through in, in this black swan. email. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the biggest things that we saw reading that Sequoia, uh, was it an email? I don't know. A blog post or… Was the Black Swan one this one or was it the COVID? No, it was a… No, not Black Swan. It was… um, Well, for… It's the, like the winter is one. coming kind of thing. Yeah. What right? was the name of that? Um, Whatever that was, I remember the, one of the biggest things I saw there was survival of the quickest. Mm. Uh, Not the fittest or anything like that. It was just really talking about, you know, the importance of uh really surviving… Uh, and uh, not going into those death spirals. Mm-hmm. And I think the underlying implication for everyone as we were reading that and you know talking to our stakeholders was the possibility of making really hard decisions to ensure not only are we um, optimizing for extending runway, but uh, really optimizing for a sustainable business, uh, i.e. you know, a profitable company. Uh, and that was no, yeah, it wasn't called Black Swan. You're right. Black Swan was the uh, the bubble. Uh, but again, yeah, but anyways, no yeah, yeah, we yeah. will be putting it in the show notes on foundersonly.hustleshare.com. Cool, on cool. Got it. Charging my phone like, over in the we'll corner, so I can't, I can't look it up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we will be there. Okay, but basically that was the warning that we all got. Yeah. yeah. Holy shit! Sequoia is saying that it's gonna be rough. Mm-hmm. We 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 kind of like okay, it's gonna be rough, but we did not see what. What, what was going to be coming because basically it was winter there was nobody willing to write checks this was triggered obviously by the chain of events was primarily because of the Ukraine war right the mm-hmm. the, the the people that was yeah. writing was all domino. these investments the domino effect the VC asset class is the highest risk right and therefore nobody is going to be willing to 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 take those tricks so everybody was doing safer bets and then there's an economic downturn Obviously, the highest risk will always be the one that first goes, right? And we're still in the middle of that. Yeah. Now, Rexy, walk, walk me through. When you guys saw this, I, if you were not the first, mm. you were easily one of the first few ones that made that adjustment. Yeah. When there was still time. Because everybody else was forced to work in an environment where no VC was writing checks. Mm-hmm. It's a complete polar opposite of what 2021 was. Right. Walk me through what was going on in inside and what was the if, if Roland was saying that it was sustainability, what was it like on your end as co-founders? Like, shit, is this even real? Because some people acted like it didn't exist. Yeah. And they got hit pretty hard. Mm. And then some people made the quick jump and you know, turned out better. And you guys were one of them. Yeah. Um, how'd you guys do that? I think, I mean, I think we were a bit lucky in terms of timing where 
Um, <laughs> I think I think the best case in terms of timing. Sometimes I wish we had raised a quarter later because that would have mm. been uh, more runway. We would have been twenty twenty two. Uh, we we would have raised at the beginning of 2022, like been making plans for aggressive growth uh, when things started to shift, right? But what actually happened was we we made the plans at the end of 2021. We oh. went into 2022 very very hard, like scaled our our head. You headcount. didn't have an idea what um, was coming. Uh, we had no idea what was coming. Oh. The the good the silver lining, or I don't know what to call it, but um, for us, I think part of why we were early in making cuts was because we were hit with a previous so there was an earlier wave um that hit us particularly which was covid reopening oh, uh, because we grew shit. so much during covid times um so when the lockdown started to I said us in PNA yeah yeah we when the lockdown started lucky. to die out this, which was yeah, around Q1 Q1 mm -hmm. 2022 was like everyone was suddenly out in manila right um that was when we started to see like oh you know the the customer acquisition costs we were seeing in 2021 were no longer holding true. The the amount of time and the amount of revenue and the retention, like everything was changing suddenly. Um, and so we were, the way Q1 2022 played out was very different from what, how we had predicted it, um, which meant by Q2, we were already primed to, to think about like, okay, if we need to reforecast, we need to, to shift gears. Um, we're not going to grow as expected. And so, uh, so we need to start making kind of cuts now. We need to, to survive, um, even before the capital market started to, to get hit. It was, it was already like, a, oh, you're ready. You're already take, having these This is going to take yeah, time. Yeah, oh, yeah. This is going to take time for us because, because the world changed for us, right? Before yeah. it changed for everybody else. Um, uh, I think the, the opening post COVID was like a COVID level event for us. Like the, the way that COVID hit brick yeah. and mortar was, was the same level of impact that it had on us and our, our user behavior and our revenue. Um, mm -hmm. so we were already shifting gears and then we saw, you know, tech markets start to cool down, um, it's a double everyone now. start to, to move. And so, so the good thing was that we, we, we started taking action a bit faster, um, or a bit earlier, but, but it also meant that we had to like kind of course correct and like do more so it wasn't it wasn't all we didn't see how bad things were going to be all at once either right uh because it was already pretty bad by q2 um just from the the covid yeah. the post-covid reopening uh and then everything and then, else hit oh uh, and then we had to kind of like make, make a second adjustment for that yeah um Whew. and for us what, ha what the the way it played out for us in particular was you know we went into 2022 um and i think in retrospect there were things I would change, but I think yeah. it was still like there were a lot of calls that just made sense with the um, the way the landscape was in 2021. Because uh, huh. in 2021, there was like there was so much capital, yeah, uh, which meant that <laughs> that the like most amazing bull run I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I wish God. I could like you can appreciate it in retrospect. I don't think we appreciated it at the time. Yeah, uh, but it was such a bull run. And what that meant it was like if you are trying to win or even survive and stay relevant like your your competition had unlimited capital right for yep. us like tiktok and bigo and Fit, like everyone was gonna had a lot of money and was gonna have more money next year and they were yeah. gonna gonna double down more next year so there was this feeling uh at the end of 2021 that we had to like we had to scale Triple up down. if we were gonna if we were yeah. gonna stay relevant um but then that changed in 2022 and suddenly everyone was like cutting costs and everyone was shift so yeah. so that it became more of a war of attrition like who can survive the longest while kind of gaining ground steadily correct, correct. uh and that's i think yeah we had to make a call to like lose some, lose a lot of battles so that we can be around win to the win war. the war yeah mm. wow that's amazing now walk me through what those conversations were like mm. to 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 shift from all right grow 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 blitzkrieg and blitz mm -hmm. blitz scale to like wait we have to make these and lose these battles and obviously one of these battles is again guys there's always certain certain levers or metrics that matter in, in any startup obviously there's burn so what is burn is your opex how much are you spending month on month to keep this thing afloat whatever you're spending on and then there's the mrr monthly recurring revenue that uh, that 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 basically uh, offsets that if your mrr is more than your burn that means you're profitable if that gap is bigger and your burn is bigger than your MRR, you're in a hell of a lot of trouble because that means you're losing money month on month. And 
what was the those conversations like and how and one thing that you you mentioned Rexy you moved fast which is key because we that we also got hit by that and I'll t- I'll tell you guys what, what later but at a very very small scale but we almost died in yeah. podcast network asia but we made the right cut at the right time just mm. in the nick of time but for you guys you did this already and you you still had enough hay in the barn right mm. to survive the winter what were those conversations like and then walk us through the harder step hardest steps that you had to go through then i guess um you know one of the key things um was for us we actually had a quarter where we were profitable wow uh, in september 2020 MMR was, MMR was around $2 million a month in Ooh. revenue and we we're a wow. profitable company, right? Wow. And so imagine you go from that to three Xing that in less than a year in wow. MMR. And, but then to your point, as uh, things were shifting and you start noticing the burn going up, yeah. the good news though, is we were able to go back and review the metrics at the time and say, okay, this is how many creators were going live. This is how um, you know, how many of our uh, most engaged users. And I think that's one of the most important things when building a sustainable business is really looking at where your highest LTV uh, customers are and really identifying the particular behaviors and then really taking a hard look at your product and really understanding what uh, we were actually delivering in terms of value to that L to those uh, high lifetime value, uh, you know, users, users in our yeah. community. And I guess the implication there then is, okay, if we have to get back to profitability again in an environment where let's go through a worst case scenario where your investor is saying, hey, uh, whatever you raise, that's all you're going to have. Wow. Right? So when you go through an exercise where you say, okay, well, if we're only going to have whatever's left in our bank account to run the business. There's an implication where, oh, wow, maybe we might have to go back to that older time when the company was a lot smaller. Right. Or where the company was a lot more lean yeah. and, and those types of things. How and big was the team at this point when you had this decision? What, we're on 500? Holy yeah, yeah. crap. Yeah. 500 people. How do you even manage that? I'll ask you guys later. Yeah. How you ran a 500 man company. Whew. And then at that point, all right, you had to make the, yeah. you had to make the thing. So again, easily guys, if you're talking about the, the highest things on any burn, it's always going to be rent, whatever else is one of these things, but always in any company, it's always going to be salaries. So you got to make some cuts. Um, was that one of the things that you instantly, all right, we got to stay leaner and really make some, let some people go? Uh, or were there any other stuff that you had? All right, wait, we can't afford to do that anymore. Yeah, I mean, well, actually, that was the the last thing we wanted to touch. I, wow. we, went, yeah, and, we went through yeah. marketing. We okay. went through product costs. Again, uh, having a social media slash, uh, you know, entertainment company, the content. So very similar. We were like looking at, okay, other companies who had to cut back on content. So for them, uh, you know, like a Netflix, right? They would have to cancel shows and those types of things. So in in our case, uh, some of our more uh, expensive creators, you know, we would actually have to cut those contracts. So I think maybe it was those types of things where we really had to, uh, exhaust everything, tech costs. Actually, tech costs is actually one of our biggest things. Before we actually had to go through that exercise of uh, cutting people. Wow. And uh, when you arrive at that point, um, there's never a, a good way to doing it. It's, a, it's always the toughest decision. I would say that uh, that was a time where, uh, you know, I just couldn't, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, that was actually, uh, I remember after the first cut, that's when I knew, uh, like I, you know, I was telling the guys, I was like, Hey, I think I want to resign. You know, like that's how bad you feel. Uh, but I was able to really, uh, say, okay, well, how about I'll just not take a salary until we break even again. Right. Those types of things. So those types of hard decisions where you had to really align yourself with your particular principles and remind yourself why you started the company in the first place. Uh, you know, asking yourself a lot of those questions to be able to arrive 
at that really hard decision to, um, you know, cut the team. So then it goes back to planning and strategies. Like, okay, well, we've identified a particular strategy to become sustainable again and, and be profitable again. And so when you actually built out that strategy, entire teams who were not part of that strategy ended up being affected. And then that's when you start having to go through that grueling process of like, okay, uh, the severance package, the um, the uh, mental health support, uh, you know, uh, what were all the different things? It, it was just like the whole through package. Um, one of the things that actually kept my uh, passion going was uh, investing mm -hmm. in some of our alumni. So some of our alumni, wow. because they have such a big severance package, you know, I was able to invest in their startup idea. Wow. Uh, we, uh, because of the community, a lot of the people that you've interviewed, we were able to find jobs for a lot of, uh, you know, with the CEOs of other startups yeah. and say, hey, are you guys hiring? You know, really trying our best to find a soft landing. It's amazing. Uh, you know, those types of things where, you know, you're losing a lot of sleep and trying to find a place. Uh, good news, I, I do think is, uh, I, I know that a lot of our engineers were able to find jobs uh, very particularly quickly because there's yeah. still a high Good. demand for developers yep. and those and types of things. you're at that point, right? You're yeah, the top yeah, notch exactly. product. Yeah. So I, I think those are the types of things. It's just really, uh, definitely, um, you know, talking to Eliza, one of our investors, we said it was a really a pain threshold increasing year where you, you go through this deep psychological um, uh, challenge. And, uh, you know, we were actually, uh, Brian Koo, one of our investors, uh, actually had dinner with us and talked about the importance of leadership in that context to be present. And I think that was one of the things I remember, um, the first time I did break down in tears, uh, during that first layoff was, uh, actually we both cried was when we had to lay off someone who had the Kumu tattoo on their body, oh my God. you know, like those types of things. And I think, um, you know, when you go through that experience and just making sure you're present, hugging them and being there and keeping in touch with them and writing the recommendation letters or investing in their startup idea or finding a job for them. Uh, just, I think that, you know, for anyone who's ever presented with uh, a really incredible hard task of letting someone go because of things that are outside of your control, um, I, I do think that it is really important to be present uh, yeah. there, you know. And uh, I can relate so much and I've done it three times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first time was in guestless.ph and I, I swore and I swore, wrote about this and then that blog that I, that went viral in 20 fucking 16. Yeah. Let 20 people go because we just didn't have runway. Was, so I let people go. It was the end. In chatbot.ph 2021 when, when Sterling decided that, all right, we're, we're going to stop the bleeding and it was out of, outside of my control. I told them, again, I had to let them go. It was the end. Recently, we had to do that in Podcast Network Asia because, again, we fell through hard times. Our, our main client churned. It's outside of our control. But this was the first time that I'm doing it to save the company. Mm. I'm getting emotional because, mm -hmm. yeah. dude, it was so hard. And it's never anyone that I, even in my worst enemy, I wouldn't want anyone to fucking let people go and tell them that their job is there because we care for each and every single one of these guys. Yeah. My God, it's so hard. Yeah. But I want to understand from your point of view because there's never a formula for this. If you look it up, even if you check GPT this out, yeah, right? Nobody's ever taught anyone how to let people go properly. And I want to know two things, guys. What are, number one, how did you guys do it? And how did you tell people that they, they, they weren't, what's the proper way of letting people go? And number mm. two, which is the hardest part, I'm still going through this right now, is for those people that are going to be left. Mm. Morale is going to be hella down. Mm. Yeah. But you have to will them to still believe you that, yo, we're still in the game. We can still win this thing. Mm. And also, Dude, at night, you're going to tell yourself, because oh, that's the hardest when you're just you and your thoughts. 
I had so many episodes where I where I would wake up sweating in the middle of the, in, the, in the middle of the night. My wife would be like, "What the hell's going on?" Yeah. And this is the human side of being a founder. Yeah. Totally. And I always say it in the trailer, heavy is the head that wears a fucking crown. Yeah. For you guys, I want to understand this because again, I'm not trying to get sympathy here. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, people lost their jobs. That's still that sucks right. more than anything. But I want to give context to what it what goes on when these things happen. Rexy. Yeah. I mean, I think there is ultimately there's there's not a right way to do it and that's because you, the, you know layoffs happen when uh the founders and the management come up with a plan that gets approved by the board and then that plan is wrong right yeah. uh, for for whether it's like reasons in your control or not in your control it's like yeah. you made the mistake as a as a leadership team again whether or not you could have predicted it is is like it, it differs and it doesn't necessarily matter but mm-hmm. uh but it's like it's it's on management it's on founders uh it's on it's on the the governance, but it's not those people that that get let go, right? It, mm. uh, and it's not it's not about um, it's not a decision that's that's uh, the who stays and who goes isn't about like whose fault it was, uh, uh, as much as it is about like who needs to be around to to get the company to where it needs to go. Yeah. Um, and so there's something like fundamentally unfair about that uh, yep. that that's always going to to be there. Um, mm-hmm. But I do think that. You know, in in like that kind of fundamentally unfair environment, like kindness does make a difference. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so whatever, and and it depends on on what what kind of situation you're in, right? Like for us, we were lucky enough to be able to 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 have resources in the bank where we were able to to give people pretty generous severance packages. Um, as Roland mentioned, the uh, mental health, extending their HMO. Um, wow. outplacement services. Uh, wow. So anything that we could we could spare to to be able to make it easier, we did. And and it's never it's never enough, right? Like yeah. you can never like no matter what you do, people are going to be pissed and they have a right to. Yeah. Um. But but I think that kind of thing is just you know if you're if you're a person that cares about other people, it's like it's Dude. it's how it's something that you you kind of have to to do as much as you can. Yeah. Um, on the morale thing, one thing that actually worked for us that I don't see, I don't hear talked about enough. Um, uh, and I don't know a lot of companies that, that do it, um, but worked for us, uh, was actually, you know, Roland sent this email that, uh, I was saying like, here's where we are. Things are going to be hard for a while. Like we'll, we'll make it, but it's going to be a hard, it, it's not like Kumu is not going to be a great place to work if you're, if you're a person who. Looking cares for a all lot the about fun. security and, yeah. and fun mm. uh even like personal development necessarily like it, it's it's not a uh unless you're the type of person who seeks out personal development you're just like hitting against like struggle and really hard yeah. problems which you know uh like, i think that's the kind of person that thrives in kumu in this in this day and age but right. if you're the type that needs a certain level of mentorship and structure like this isn't really the time to no. uh to to be here so so just being transparent about that and then giving people actually the option to to uh jump ship yeah to leave and still get yeah. the severance package right they they still wow. got um a few months of salary um they wow. they got the uh just everything that we gave to the people who who got laid off um and you know, one way to look at it is like, if they if they were gonna resign, then like then that's extra cost for the company. But then the other way, which I think is more representative, is like you would have probably kept a, the majority of those people who like in their hearts didn't want to stay anymore, mm-hmm. uh, and the company would have paid for somebody who wasn't even there, and that person would have been you know in this place that they mm-hmm. they that wasn't a fit with them in this part of their of their life. Uh, so that just made it easier for. For both sides, for us, uh, and we did so. The vast majority of people who took that option were actually people that were in teams that we knew we had to mm. to size down anyway. Got it. Um, but we did lose some people that were great, like, oh. and it just wasn't the right time, right? But it's it's it, it's better Oof. to to kind of be on a ship where you know everyone's there because they they chose to be. Yeah. Um, Sorry for going. Yeah, that's exactly re- yeah. that, that. That's exactly it. I, I think I, I remember that time. Uh, you know, when you actually have a. Uh, an opportunity, you know, uh, communicate very clear transparency from a leadership perspective. This is the state of the company. And, you know, basically you have three options. One, are you like super dialed in, ready to fight? You know, just showing the, uh, I was even referencing like war, 
movies, Braveheart scenes, Rocky, you know, ro- th- th- that type of stuff, right? Yeah. So, you know, are you dialed in? Or two, are you lost and you need to meet with me personally to talk through wow. your 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 situation in terms of what is your role in terms of getting uh, Kumu back to being profitable again? Or uh, number three, is your season over uh, at Kumu? And wow. and then from there, giving the proper time for the people who do feel lost to either choose, uh, are you dialed in or is your season over? And then my next phase of communication was, okay, there's no time to think about being lost anymore. You're either dialed in or your season's over. And through that process, uh, really getting to the heart of the particular problem and I think that's when it, you, it becomes really important at that point where you start leaning on your leaders, you know, yeah. uh, folks like Ari, who's just uh, been really amazing from an operational perspective and Mark, our CFO, and those types of things. And, uh, you know, really bringing in uh, key consultants and specialists who have done this before. And I, I think... Um, you know, from a communication perspective. And you know what? Even despite all of that, uh, you're still going to get criticized. And yeah. so that's the number one thing I also want to, you know, encourage any entrepreneur is that, uh, actually, I don't know if it's actually encouraging. Because uh, <laughs> so, I was going to say, like, no matter how, uh, like, the world is going to continue to move forward despite all your pain and uh, the woe is me. And I think that's why it's like super, super important for you to really believe in the mission, to truly believe and just kind of have that, I don't know if it's a black mamba, Kobe, (laughs) ice cold resolve to continue pushing forward despite the fact, because here we were just talking about maybe over the last 10 minutes about the the heartbreak and the amount of deep thinking and decision-making that you have to do to make these hard calls. And even despite all of that, to answer your question of whether, you know, what is the proper way of doing this is no matter what you do, Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be extremely criticized. People are going to think you're dumb or stupid under their breaths. People are going to hate you, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, it's, one again, it was a pain threshold increasing year because no matter what, then you start realizing, and then I start looking at Rexy is it this is like one of the more um kind of ironic things is you start uh focusing on the gratitude where you start reminding yourself. I was looking at these those original emails where I wrote to Rexy back in 2017 about starting Kumu mm. and reminding ourselves why we started this company in the first place wow. or you know looking at and talking to some of those early people and and really spending time uh with those because again i don't want it to be a statistic when i say oh you know it's really important to focus on those high lifetime value users yeah uh to get back to sustainability yeah. no i actually went on the app and started talking to those high wow. lifetime ltv users where they say you know uh because look example I go there and go, oh, wow, here's a high revenue generating user on Kumu, Mm -hmm. right? But instead of being a statistic, one thing that will help you remind you of this beautiful product market fit that you're Mm -hmm. trying to find is you start talking to them and you're like, oh, this person spent so much on Kumu because it helped them with their depression. They found their sense of belonging. They um, were able to pay their bills to support their family. You know, you and I think that's what's super important too, that. Uh, when you're at a particular stage and mm. you're looking at that data uh, to not simply just look at the high value data that shows that you are building a sustainable company, yeah. Uh, depending on the type of product you have, I encourage you to pick up the phone or message Talk or in our case, live stream leaders. and spend time with your community. Yes. And you start reminding yourself like, oh, this is why I started Kumu in the first place. Yes. You absolutely. know, like, um, like for example, Imagine back in 2021, right? We're we're engaging all these creators. We're we're trying to uh, get every all the 100 million Filipinos, and that and that 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 costs a lot of money. Mm. But then getting back to sustainability, we realized, wow, we have really strong product market fit with overseas Filipinos. Wow, who support 
Gen Z and millennial content creators back home. Uh, back home. Mm -hmm. When you look at that, okay, fine. There's only 12 million Filipinos around the world who send billions of dollars back home. And there's only thousands of Gen Z millennial creators. So technically we don't really need that big of a company to be break even cash flow positive. Makes sense. So you zeroed in on that demographic or, or that user base. Yeah. And then when you start spending time with them, like I was, uh, you know, for example, healthcare workers in California, you know, we, instead of spending, you know, crazy amounts of money on, you know, a reality TV show concept, right. uh, we spent a fraction of that doing a singing contest for healthcare workers in the US. And the wow. grand prize is a private concert with uh, Gary Vee in Las Vegas. And you know, that type Ooh. of thing where, yeah, see, do you see what I'm saying? It's like the programming still has that core value around mm -hmm. focusing on the community, uh, but, but we didn't have to spend so much money to try to get everyone there. We realized, okay, healthcare workers get a lot of value being entertained by uh you know our creators back home and you know really focusing on that community you know and wow. and, and so those are the types of things i really want to encourage uh, any founders who are uh, struggling is to really remind themselves a why you started the company in the first mm -hmm. place uh wow. you know spending time with your 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 team and and getting dialed in there and then number two is actually spending time with your um, your customers mm -hmm. you know that is amazing. All right, now let's take our first break. And when we come back, we will now talk to other founders that, again, uh, are, are friends from the Hustle Share and Founders Only community who want to talk to Roland and Rexy in this podcast of Founders Only. Super intense already in the first part. Uh, oh, yeah? Was it? Oh, cool. That's just the first part. When we, yeah, when, yeah, yeah. when we come back, we'll be talking about that more. But let's talk about that more after the break. Hey hustlers, are you tired of bank transfer fees and low interest rates on your savings? Say hello to GoTime Bank. GoTime Bank offers interest rates 50x higher than traditional banks. Enjoy this rate on your savings. No minimum amount, no deposit caps, and no tasks or missions to complete. With GoTime Bank, you can make quick and secure transfers to other banks with three bank transfers per week. Plus, earn Go Rewards points and redeem them as cash with a simple tap in the GoTime Bank app. Experience the next level of banking with GoTime Bank. Download the app now or visit www.gotime.com.ph to experience next level banking. It's GoTime! Hey Hustlers, it's a brand new season and I have a brand new tool that will help you scale your startup properly as you grow your team and give them equity eventually. And if you want to have a record of ownership management, efficient equity workflow, and award grants digitally, Capita has you covered with CapMap. CapMap is designed to enable CapTable and ESOP management, as well as digital share insurance for companies across South and Southeast Asia. Also, Capita provides ESOP advisory services for you to set up your plan and engage your employees through equity awards. And trust me, this is a boon because as you grow your team, you want to give their best people a piece of the company that they're hustling for. Investing shares and giving ESOP is not easy if you don't have a product like this. So please do check it out and sign up now at Capita.com with a Q. Again, that's Capita.com with a Q. And it's free for companies that have under 25 stakeholders. Get ready to experience the power of seamless equity workflow management today. And we're back from the break. We are still with Roland Rexy of Kumu, who then told us the intense. Ooh, I, I almost cried there because again, it's <laughs> never, never uh, easy, you. man. Again. Yeah. For Letting sure. people go whether it's just one person, mm -hmm. hundreds, man, it, it, it's so traumatic as a, as a startup founder. But again, we have to pull through. You already talked about how you're going to be able to bounce back, how you're going to be able to, you know, uh, rally the team back. But at the end of the day, you're also people, mm. right? Yeah. And one, one question that got thrown at us in Startup PH from Chris Guzman says, how do you founders cope with the press pressure or stress with their current startup? And how do you then find balance? Is there even balance? I don't think there's such a thing. <laughs> what is a balance in startup? I think there's like attempts to be balanced. Um, I think they're like, 
it's plateaus or like lily ponds of like balance and <laughs> and then you're like oh yeah i think i've gotten there right. and then and it's and like the next it wave like, yeah, exactly <laughs> but how, how do you guys scope because at the end of the day again we're still in the middle of the war yeah mm-hmm. right this is still effed up mm-hmm. and we don't know i mean we think we see the end of the tunnel but when you're a wartime ceo you're a wartime founder mm-hmm. what the hell is balance right you can cope a little bit but at the end of the day you wake up and it's wartime right away and you got to rally your team you got to fight for survival let's talk about that real quick from mm. from your from your, your your side Rexy and Roland how did you how do you cope and was is there balance <laughs> what is balance never heard of that in a while but yeah how, what was that like for you guys i think on i mean for me on a day to day um, there's there's been more, but like the the highs a bit. The, the highs can only get so high, and then but then the lows get lower. Oh, hell you know? that's a, that's the thing. Seventh mm-hmm. level of hell, bro. Um, yeah. So, so it's like I I do think like on a day to day, if you look at my schedule versus um versus when we were starting Kumu, like when I when we were starting Kumu, like it couldn't step away from the phone for more than like ten minutes without feeling something might have happened, right? Or like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's or like anxiety. To, yeah, yeah, when you're yeah. not getting notifications. <laughs> right, right. Or you know, like uh, there was a year in Kumu. I think we mentioned in the previous episode. There was a year of Kumu where we were running out of money practically every month and so you just had to always <laughs> uh, yeah. be on um, trying to make sure that you'd make it to the next month and the uh-huh. next month uh, so I think there, there's less of that and so there uh-huh. is more of like you know time in the evening and on the weekends um, yeah. uh, and I think that's part of it is like just having people that we trust mm-hmm. now instead of having to do everything ourselves yeah um, uh, but then, yeah, again, again, you can like have like a month or two of that. And then you're like, okay, I think I'm like, I've found my equilibrium. And then suddenly the world comes and hits <laughs> you with over. another, Flipped over. Yeah, 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 big That's exactly. thing. And, and so, so yeah. for me, it's yeah. been, you know, I think I, well, one thing is that at least now that it's, how long has it been? Five years? Six? Yeah, five. Has it been? 2018. Five going on six. When I had you on the show, it was 2019. Yeah, so that was about a Bro. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So five years wow. going on six. Yeah, five years going um, on six. Yeah, that also means that we've had five or six years of learning how to, and then all our, all the time before that, right? In terms of learning right. how to deal with stress, and um, and I remember when I, uh, what's helped is with me and Roland. It's usually like one of us is on the <laughs> edge of burnout. Okay. Uh, but the other one is kind of like pulling the other way and right. is like re-energizing themselves. Uh, so it kind of like we we yeah, we help. Actually, um, yeah. Uh, that, so, so there was a time in like 2019. I think that was the first time for me when I just really hit my tipping <laughs> point and I just okay. like felt like dying. That, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, Series A. Yeah, yeah. That was like wow, the lead up to that's Series the hardest A. One. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, uh, I remember that. But Roland was there and he he like really helped carry the weight. Someone's um, gotta be then, the rock, right? Sometimes, right? Yeah, like yeah. me, Joe, me and Joseph. Yeah. Right. We're both big rocks, by the way. Literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but someone's gotta be strong for one. Yeah. And sometimes, but this all happens behind closed doors because you right, can't right. do this in front of your team. You have to show yeah, boys. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Mm. And so there was like, I mean, like there was that. And then I, I also learned, I, I got my first dog around that oh, time. And I have two yeah. dogs. Um, Doggos. So that, that, that Doggo helped a lot. therapy. Um, I, le- I learned that I can, I can lean on my then girlfriend, now wife. Um, mm, they're uh, getting married too. You got next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Show the ring, bro. And, okay. uh, and yeah, just like kind of like making time for, for thing. I think we, we had an episode on Kumu just recently. We were talking about like making time for just to be able to do things that you love, um, outside of work is, is important too. For me, that's writing. Um, uh, like I was always, the writing was always the thing that I like to do. Got it. You know, I think when I was 10 years old, I was uploading stuff on Fiction Press and fanfiction.net. Mm. Um, so that was like the thing that I hadn't like gone back that's to in a outlet. while. And mm. that's that's kind of my outlet for, nice. my, that's that's my therapy, I nice. think, is, is kind of going through that. Right. Uh, so I just like had this, now I have like a toolkit of things that I go yeah. to when I, when I start to get close to hitting my breaking point. And now I have a sense also of like, I feel like I'm going to hit a breaking point. So yeah. maybe it's the time to kind of chill this weekend. Right. Uh, and refresh. Mm. Rowan, uh, for you, how do you cope? Cope. I think, um, <laughs> you know, it's a funny question because it's always uh, a struggle. I, I think uh, to Rexy's point on a day-to-day basis, uh, I think 
I I don't know if it was at Hushal Share or I forget which interview it was. I do talk about the importance of the daily ritual. And, you know, I can't actually start my day without actually doing the daily ritual where I wake up in the morning, do my quiet time, pray, read my goals. I thought you are wake up in the morning feeling like P. Diddy. Kind of thing. No. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, you know, those Brush types of things. With a bottle of Jack. Sorry, that's oh, just no showing way, really. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, but yeah, so the, the ritual ends with uh, the coffee and then then, wow. then I, I start working. So, uh, so it's literally, uh, you know, the quiet time, gratitude, nice. three things I'm going to get done today. Um, you know, the, the exercise and then, and then the coffee. Mm. And, um, one thing that I've learned by having a particular routine is the importance of this concept. I have learned, uh, just called steady state joy, mm. steady state uh, joy, steady state joy, you know, big shout out to the evangelist Paul, who was out, you know, around here about 2000 years ago. And the mm. thing about steady state joy is it's really easy to be happy when things are good. It's really easy to be sad when things are bad. But if you're joyful on a daily basis, you actually find gratitude in the good and the bad. Mm. And then you start waking up during these quiet time moments and you start going like, oh, okay, well, I'm breathing, I'm alive. That's when things are really bad when you're grateful for breathing <laughs> and being yeah. alive, yeah. Yeah. right? And then when things are really good, the things you're gratitude about is like, you know, uh, focusing on being humble, uh, you know, um, right. that, and this is something ironically, uh, saw on a reel, uh, with Tom Hanks, he was talking about, uh, reminding, uh, himself that this too shall pass, whether things are really good or things yeah. are really bad, that this too shall pass, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. So similar to mm -hmm. this mindset of this too shall pass and steady state joy is that even when things are really good, wow, you know, like a lot of times, like, um, to be honest, uh, a lot of my anxiety actually started occurring when I feel mm -hmm. like there was like so much hype going on because I know for a fact that like, we're, you know, 10 X away from where or actually not even 10 X, I would say a hundred times away from where we really wanted to be. Wow. And then we were being seen as like the next unicorn, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm you know, sorry to, if, 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 if there was me creating <laughs> no, so no, much No, 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 not you. It wasn't even you, but like oh, there was a time, I think uh, <laughs> the, the most anxious I started getting was like, you know, getting, uh, we were on the cover of like Esquire. I was a cover on another magazine and I was just like, oh dude, like, I already know people are hating on me. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> like the moment I saw myself on a on a cover of a magazine, I was like, "Oh, dude, here I comes being thing. in Rockwell." Yeah. You know, here Picking comes up the, one of these things. Yeah, like, yeah. See, I know uh, this guy. I'll kiss him. <laughs> you know, and and again, there was that steady state joy thing where yeah. you actually had to remind yourself that this too shall pass. Like similar to anyone else who's had a lot of hype, you know, people are just gonna wait for you to fall down. People are gonna just be joyful about um, like right now there's probably people happy that we're struggling mm, or those types of sure. things. Which is we and, gotta stop. By you know, way, which is totally fine. And I think that's why it's super important not to take things personally and remind yourself that, you know, uh, like my, actually one of my best uh, analogies for struggling and failing is the concept of, uh, hypertrophy I think is how you say it with the muscle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a muscle has to when you're working out and you can't pick up that weight anymore it's because your muscle failed and you can't lift anymore right but the whole point of working out is your muscle has to fail so that mm -hmm. it repairs itself right. and, and it then after stronger. yeah and then the muscle becomes stronger yep. so when I say that we're struggling or those it's the type of muscles that we're actually learning that I'm actually in a weird way, mm. grateful that Kumu is actually going through this right now because we're actually learning how to execute in this environment because who I'm also really worried about right now are a mm. lot of the startup founders who hit unicorn valuation or actually IPO'd say in markets like Indonesia mm. back in 2021, where you know we were talking about being a unicorn. They're in a multi-billion dollar Oof. valuation with no no pathway to profitability and to and when the stock market crashes yeah. it crashes with them that's exactly it so i think that's one of the things is imagine being an entrepreneur back then where you ipo and raise hundreds of millions of dollars Oof. and create these types of muscles mm. whereas the type of muscles that we're learning in this day and age to build a sustainable company to mm. build a profitable company 
with the right unit economics and the right fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, I, I just want to encourage everyone. This is actually a really cool time to actually build a company of quote unquote unicorn valuation yep. mm -hmm. is to learn these muscles. Correct. Yeah. Now I'm sounding super confident, but I'm going to be completely honest with you. It's also very painful to say <laughs> it's that. Scary as fuck, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's why it's important for mm. me to have the daily ritual where I'm reminding myself. It's like going going back to the muscle analogy. It's like you wake up in the morning and you're so tired, and you don't want to go to the gym and you don't want to exercise, but you know that if you're just consistent and you never give up and you do those push-ups and you do those 30 minutes per day, someday, yeah. months down the road, you're going to have, you know, a healthier body. Yep. Yeah. You know? Yep. That's, so. I want to remind everyone, it's the same thing. Look, it sucks, but you're learning muscles. You're working out because someday you're going to look in the mirror and notice that your company is healthier than 90% of the other companies out there. Mm. And you, you know? figured out how to survive. And that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, right now, the people that are thriving are those ones where whatever it is that they're doing is it's, it's cockroach startups. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Survival, Survival, is. Survival is winning. What theme right now. was Sunicorns right now? It's it's cockroaches, cockroaches with a sure. unicorn yeah. uh, <laughs> horn on it. But yeah. they're still flying. Because imagine, I mean, like when it, it was Q2, right? Q2 last yeah. year when things started to shift. That means that it's this, it's around. Now in the next couple of quarters where it's like the 18 month point since the last raise of a lot of startups oh, yeah, is going to be coming up. True, true, true. Um, Those runways but, are hella, hella thin now and you're mm -hmm. going to have to find a way right now. And I don't see an end in sight. The only way to get there if you're a startup is to be, think like a traditional business. You got to mm -hmm. get as close as possible if yeah. you can. You have to be in the black. You have to yeah. be profitable. Unless yeah. you're an AI company, then you there can you do go. whatever the hell you <laughs> <laughs> Flavor of the month. Yeah, yeah, well, I wanted yeah, to yeah. I wanted to um go back a little bit into I, I really like what Roland said about the the what was it? Steady state joy. Yeah. Um <laughs> I'm not like super like philosophical, but I think yeah. I, I, I'm like low key uh uh existentialist slash absurdist. Mm. And what that means is like both both are like, you know responses to to nihilism right i'm going yeah. this is like my first time like going deep into philosophy you know what yeah uh, and basically your response is like what if like there's no meaning in the world mm. uh, and existentialism is 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 like okay there's no meaning so like you create your own meaning mm. uh and absurdism is like um is you know there's no meaning you have to enjoy there being possibly being no meaning and the 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 um when when roland was talking about the um the uh kind of going through and exercising your muscles yeah. um one of the the my favorite books when i was in college was um the myth of sisyphus uh mm -hmm. which is like this absurdist existentialist yeah. like book uh it's weirdly enough uh sorry i'll just yeah, say yeah, yeah. somebody called me a sisyphus mm, yeah 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 i think we're all i, think, I had no idea what the hell sisyphus was <laughs> i think startup so I founders are very sisyphus like they have right, to so be like sisyphian. for those people what is sisyphus <laughs> and what's the myth of sisyphus because i'm not sure if i was going to be offended by it when somebody called me <laughs> all right so it's sisyphus like, i don't know like i don't know the full story but he's this figure in greek mythology mm -hmm. uh i forgot what he did but he did something that pissed off the gods and yep. he, so he was condemned he to condemned to he has to push a boulder up a hill and then you know, and spend a long time getting that heavy boulder up right. the hill, and then as soon as it gets up to the top of the hill, it falls back rolls down. Rolls back down. Oh my god! <laughs> and he has to keep pushing it back up, and it rolls and back down. And where are these idiots trying to pull all these bo these yeah, boulders yeah. up to the top for it to just crumble all the way down, no. over yeah. and over exactly. and over again? Exactly. And the, the what what the book, the myth of Sisyphus, says is like you know if you if you can if there's any way to like imagine. Um, uh, like living in a world where you don't know if there's meaning, like you have to be able to imagine a world where Sisyphus can be happy, right? Like this guy, like roll, pushing the boulder up the hill, he knows that like it's never going to stay up. Like yeah. there's never going to be an end in sight, but like, can you, can, can he be happy doing, being in that process? Yeah. He's pushing the boulder now up. for sure. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, 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 so yeah. that's the thing here too, right? It's like on one side, the, like the yeah. existentialist in me is like, is like this is sad. You know, everything right? that we're or you know the, the, the nihilist is like I'm sad. Yeah. The existentialist is like I'm sad, but this you know the mission that we're anchored on, which is like 
building this community and like to going to the next level of Filipino creativity. Yeah. Um, that's the meaning that I'm creating in this world. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's enough for me to keep going. Mm -hmm. And the absurdist in me is like, even if we don't get there, like this is like, it's worth it. you know, th this, this process in itself, it has to be worth it. And yeah. like enjoying the, every second of it. Just like the great philosopher Kanye West said, what doesn't yeah. kill you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you know, and, and that's one thing, uh, you know, what Rexy just shared that I, I also want to encourage folks to, although it doesn't sound like encouragement, is, well, actually this this one particular part, mm -hmm. the also the silver lining of going through this, it gives you that certain level of humility and a reminder to not yeah. have your identity centered on the performance mm -hmm. of the startup, especially if there are things outside of your control. Yep. Because like, you know, one of the things that I always, uh, one of my personal dreams and missions in life it's not so much to be that person on the top, but to be the shoulders mm -hmm. of someone to use your shoulders and step up. Wow. And one thing I have to, we have to remind ourselves too, is not only Kumu, but Rexy and I didn't move to the Philippines to start a live streaming app. That was not mm -hmm. our goal. Our goal was we shared this dream that we have these close ties back home in the Philippines and that there is a global community of Filipinos all around the world. And there's maybe a way that we could engage the diaspora in a way to better the motherland. That our goal in life was to really help the motherland through digital transformation, those types of things. And so yeah. it's kind of like, oh, wow. Okay, well, because of this thing that we built, mm -hmm. uh, it helped the ecosystem in a way, right? You have uh, Blue Trip in Institutional International Investors yep. coming in. Uh, you know, one of the first startups who raised over $100 million in those types of things. And what was that impact in terms of being the first Series C in the country and those types of things? And, and you know, and that's one of those things about what Rexy's talking about is just detaching yourself from taking things too personally and yeah. actually enjoying this experience. Yep. Like, wow, we actually have this opportunity to have change within the, the average humans about 30,000 days, right? I've lived about 15, 16,000 of those days already. Mm -hmm. I have about 14,000 days left on earth before I could, you know, maybe upload myself into the cloud. Anyways, we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> but the whole point That's is- the next episode. <laughs> yeah, the next episode, <laughs> uploading yourself into the cloud. And I, I think that um, going back to steady state joy and the day-to-day -day experience is not taking yourself too seriously but taking the mission yeah. seriously, because if you're completely 100% honest with the mission of what you're trying to build, do not take the company performance personally because you start um, taking your, or no, sorry, you start taking yourself too seriously. And I feel like when a company uh does well yeah uh then ego gets involved yep you uh lose sight of the mission mm -hmm. you start thinking that uh you'll never make a mistake and it really puts you down a path that i don't think is actually healthy yeah whereas one of the sweet sweet experiences of going through um you know uh this particular challenge that we have in front of us is uh, that humility, the uh, only focusing on the things that matter, going back to the fundamentals, uh, just being completely authentic and real about the situation that I think uh, is actually really cool. That is you know? amazing. All right. Uh, now, Again, this guy's been b beside me. He's been like, what the hell? You're not calling me for the wrong <laughs> yeah. time. But let's address him. His name My is turn. Gabriel Abbott. He's been a part of the premium membership of the Hustle oh, cool. Share hey. and Founders Only hey, Community. Hey, and he's here. Again, that's, these are small perks. If you want to check it out, it's premium.hustleshare.com. Where you can join our community and be part of this recording. Oh, how are you liking it so far, Gab? 
It's am- this is amazing. Okay, again, so you're part of founders only yeah. now. Okay, but <laughs> Yab is actually a first time founder. He's starting up. Uh, oh wow, his, cool. Uh, first startup, but he has some questions for you. So go ahead, Yab. Yeah. Yab. Right. So I think they they covered like a lot of things that that you, you guys have mm-hmm. been through. So I just want to to um, have a deep dive into the partnership that you guys have. Mm. So I mean, you've got, you guys have been through wars like ro- bull runs and and mm-hmm. winters, right? So you know, being being able to go through that, and then you guys are still here, like together, and in, in, inside a partnership. If there are tips to making a marriage work, what are the <laughs> tips? What are the tips? What are the tips in making a partnership? Work? Make sure like, one fun. of you are bu- is bald, fun. like me. I'm bald, right? Yeah. 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 Joseph yeah, has up. long hair. Okay. It's, just like, <laughs> it's like magnets, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I uh, you know, it, it's really important to, you know, uh, there's actually a, a new book I just picked up. It's actually more of a journal. Are you guys familiar with Ray Dalio? Yeah. Uh, My Principles. Principles. Yep. And, you know, this ability to work with other people and, but to work with other people, it's critical to be self-aware of your strengths and weaknesses. Mm. You know, me understanding that, you know, I have a huge heart for um, relationships, which is a natural for business development, those types of things. Yep. I, uh, without being cocky, I do think there's a certain level of inspiring energy that I bring to the table, those types of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Best in the business, man. But I, I mm-hmm. think that when it comes to, um, you know, follow through, uh, being all over the place, all those things, those are weaknesses that I'm actually very, very <laughs> self aware of. Right, right. And not to take it personally and to embrace that and find someone, you know, who just compliments uh, those particular things, right? And, you know, I, I it was so weird. I, I remember the first time I ever met Rexy and he told me, um, you know, he, he, he had founded uh, Kaya Collaborative, you know, as a college student. And he was doing work where he was sending these Filipino students from the best universities around the world and sending them back home. And I was like, that's what I've always wanted to do. I've inspired people to think about it, but I've never actually done it. So, you know what I mean? And those types of things. And that's when you start realizing, wow, like when you're in the presence of someone who has a great energy that uh, can do the things that you cannot do and exploring going into certain adventures together. Um, Yeah, I I think uh, before even thinking about getting into partnership with another person, Mm -hmm. I think there's a requirement to be self-aware of your own strength and weaknesses so that you even know where to go in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that takes a lot of internal work. That takes a lot of emotional maturity. And when I say emotional maturity, that's just a code word of being completely honest with your fears and insecurities. Yes. Right? Because if you're not honest with your fears and insecurities, you know, uh, abandonment, taking things personally, (laughs) those are my own personal ones. But the thing (laughs) is, I think... (laughs) I I think you really, really have to be honest with your fears and insecurities to build that emotional security to build that self-awareness and have that internal work required to actually find a partner um which ironically you use the word marriage i think that's also requirement for romantic <laughs> no it is it is it's true we're both married men you know and these are the things you got yeah. you have to yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not it's just like having wives, right? You're, yeah, yeah. You know, whether you think yeah. you're right, mm-hmm. she's right. There you go. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So for Rexy, do you want to chime in on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I was. I had. I had one. I had two points in mind. I'm trying to remember what the what the first one was. Uh, but I think I'll, I'll start with the 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 second, which was. Roland talked about the the kind of compliment part, yeah. piece of it. Uh, I think the other the other side of it is is also the the alignment and especially alignment when it's like when when the alignment is important is when it the, it it's not the same alignment as with everybody else. Correct. Like when like when we're in a room and we're talking about something and uh, and it feels like everybody else 
in the room is uh, is kind of hovering around a certain consensus, but then the right. two of us are looking at each other like, "Wait a second, <laughs> like Wait, no, something's no. off here." Right? Yeah. Uh, I think those are those are the times where we've we've had to kind of um, where either we've made decisions that uh, that end up being important to the company, mm. or we like look back and say like, oh, "We should have," you know. Like I think we both we knew in our guts mm. that this was something that yeah. that um, we should have done differently, but it felt like you know. Yeah. Uh, whether it's investors or team members or just the the overall sector, right? Like, mm. uh, I think he one of the things that, that was brought up was the fact that um, in good times, like the phrase is "a rising tide lifts all boats," but yep. I think that also means that like it lifts a lot of shitty boats. Fuck yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, and then you end up uh, kind of things end up being uh i mean that's a strong word right like i, I don't mean, i don't mean shitty boats but uh but barnacles also but practices <laughs> kind of happen and yeah. become become dogma and become the norm that yeah uh that actually aren't the best way to do things yeah. um but just because like somebody in silicon valley did it and mm. then some somebody in china does it and mm. get, it's inherited in the southeast asian region somewhere mm -hmm. it becomes kind of the 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 common uh like common sense uh, even yep. though it's not it's not uh it's not backed up by by reality um so i think it's in it's in those moments where you know people you're surrounded by people who maybe know less about the business who aren't who haven't been around as, as long as you um and kind of with with that with the uh with that amount of knowledge, have a certain view of where the company should go, uh, but kind of the two of us having the, sh the shared values and the uh, uh, and the shared experience of having been through this the past almost six years. Um, uh, there's that thing, right? Like when when both of our when both of our sensors go off, it's like okay, Ding! there's something there's something there. That's wrong. There's um, something wrong. And uh, and then the other piece, yeah, I remember my my first what was supposed to be my first point was. Uh, just kind of like having a co-founder that you feel like equals with is a really, really important thing. And I remember, cause, cause we're like 10 years apart. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. so I, you know, I, when I was starting then I had worked with a lot of people who were, who were like 10 or more years older than me. And like, there was definitely a, a sense that like I was the, the kid the in junior. the room, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and I think that with the role was always a situation where, uh, almost from the beginning, it was like, we were equal equal parts in um in sharing nice. ideas and uh and building things mm -hmm. um and that's that's continued to be the case i think for uh six years into kumu Gab? yeah so um this is just for other um uh for other startup founder founders as well who's you know st starting out at the moment mm -hmm. so coming from my question a while ago what were the healthy boundaries that you you, hmm. you guys this really are. sounds like marriage yeah, yeah, this is a healthy boundaries it's a relationship podcast yeah, I love it. it's fine I'm just kidding <laughs> healthy I boundaries went through with this uh, co-founders yeah. yeah. well yeah. you know I think um, don't call me a there three might, there might All actually right. be uh, you know I want to challenge this whole notion of the the co-founder concept where uh, you already actually have the team in place uh, because if you, if you actually look at these situations. I remember, um, for example, with my first startup, um, our advisors, uh, Luke and Kenny, they were actually uh, PayPal co-founders wow. with Peter and Elon, right? And I remember wow. when I was hanging out with them and you start talking to them, they're like, oh, that didn't, that wasn't like intentional. Um, Luke and Kenny were, uh, had met Peter at Stanford and they were building a thing. And then Elon was building something else. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it was funny. It was like a, a um, a payment system for mm. the Palm Pilot. So right. product market fit, the product was great, but there was no product market fit because like that was way ahead of their time, yeah. like mobile payments back yeah. in like the early 90s. Yeah. But then when, uh, I forgot if it was Elon or Peter, they said, oh, why don't we just use this technology and apply it to eBay? So then that's when they rebranded themselves as PayPal and then they sold it. But again, when you look at that team, it was separate teams, co-founders, that type of stuff. And then when Luke and Kenny had founded this venture fund called Founders Fund. Peter had met uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg at the time and they had led the seed or series A on yeah, Facebook. Yep, yep. And if you look at their founding history, it didn't actually, the what they're listed, I mean, there was even a whole movie about how one of their key co-founders wasn't even uh, a part of that thing. And 
another favorite of mine is ironically a movie called Founder about the McDonald's mm -hmm. founding. Yep. And Ray he's, Kroc. Ray Kroc is widely seen as like the yeah. founding CEO, but there is no history about the people who actually started it. Yeah. And so the reason why I'm bringing up all these examples is to not have this romantic notion of mm. having the perfect co-founding base. Because even in Kumu's context, mm. you know, I had my cousin, Claire, uh, who was uh, on the original team. Uh, Andrew was one of, of our, uh, one of my fraternity brothers from college. And if we consider going from zero to one being series C, Mm. Then going from zero to 0.75 and zero to 0.5 mm. and zero to 0.25 were completely different, quote unquote, co-founding sets where that, like, even up to now, uh, James uh, and Angelo, who are considered, mm -hmm. widely considered uh, co-founders of Kumu, actually, Kumu was actually around for more than a year and they were yeah. actually volunteering mm -hmm. as members. Mm. Uh, and they didn't actually be recognized as co-founder until what, like a, yeah, a yeah. year after. Wow. So I, but I their think, DNA is like, it, it yeah, feels but like then it's you can also, that's exactly, that, that's exactly my point is that even though they joined later, Kumu would not be mm. Kumu without Angelo and James. It, that's yep. so clear. So clear. And that's what I mean where I start realizing, oh, that's why Ray Kroc is widely considered the founding CEO. Why? Oh, Elon Musk is widely considered the 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 founding, founding of CEO of Tesla yeah, yeah. when he actually pushed some folks out to get there, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you know, that's the, exactly the same thing that happened to us. So as a founding uh as a founder at the earliest stages, um not having such a clear romantic notion or, or trying to have so much control over who actually ends up becoming recognized as a co-founder because depending on how the product market fit develops and having the right people to help you achieve that product market fit, sometimes there are going to be situations where, actually not sometimes, there's going to be a situation awesome. where co-founders who were with you in the very beginning are definitely not going to be there. No. And people who start out as volunteers or early users end up becoming your co-founder. It, it just it just happens. That's why I need vesting because prior to recording this whole thing, he was asking mm. me that, hey, I'm, I'm trying to look for co-founders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he didn't know how to give out equity yet. I was like, don't yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, I did yeah, that yeah, mistake. Yeah, yeah. Vesting. Yeah. Vest it out <laughs> with yeah. a cliff. Okay, so that you, if again, in these processes where you thought they're going to be there forever, but they were only there for a year and whatnot, you didn't give them their whole mm -hmm. share. They only got what they earned. Right. Okay, last question. Last question. So this is just out of curiosity because um, Roland mentioned a while ago about the deep psychological challenges that, mm. you know, that the tech star startup industry has, mm -hmm. like the, the ups and the lows and yeah. you know, everything in between. Uh -huh. Um, you know, there's just a lot of options to to make like a career or like a living. Like you know, you can mm. just invest in in a different pieces of two startups. Yeah. Yeah. Much easier yeah. ways to make money. Yeah. 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 you can just invest and then sit by the beach. Yep. Yeah, yeah, but but like, what's in a tech startup scene that motivates you, that pushes you, that even though the road ahead may have you know a lot of deep psychological challenges, mm. you'll still be there. Like you'll see through, th you'll see things mm. through. So. Ooh. I think it's uh, it's different for yeah for each of us. I think for for me, um, and I this isn't like the definitive way to to see it, um, or necessarily fully accurate. But but it's like one way to kind of think about it is I think Roland Roland kind of brings to Kumu the the uh, authenticity and community side of it, and like that's the kind of the part of Kumu that he like he 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 stands for and really like guards the equation. Yeah. Uh and then I I bring uh I bring more of um I definitely kind of came in more, although I came from a nonprofit like community background, mm. like what was always in my heart was like creativity and media and culture. And I just get really excited by people making things. Yep. Um uh and so I think for me that's what gets me kind of going is uh and keeps me going with kumu is that we feel like you know through everything uh more and more I have this conviction that this is the place to to be able to where i have the biggest chance to be able to make an impact on culture um uh and 
in culture more broadly and globally, but through Filipino culture and through my identity as a Filipino. Um, uh, that at a broad level, at like a, 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 a existentialist, like make my own meaning level. And then at an absurdist, like Sisyphus level, it's just fun, right? On the day to day, like making things, like yeah. whether it's stories, streams, animations, like finding meeting creators and seeing like the, their potential that's just the the kind of thing that i want to be surrounded by and doing uh on a daily basis so so that's i think what pushes me and like i still like if i didn't have to worry about money maybe i would just retire and write yes. uh, but to the degree Play that games, right. to the degree that like i have to be employed somewhere like this is the only place i can i can think of yeah. to where where i'd be able to uh to kind of find that that fit with the things that that keep me keep me alive mm -hmm. yeah you know that's a really interesting uh question you know one of the things i i think it's also just the particular generation that we're at in this particular human history you know there was a time back home uh in the u.s where uh you know you could actually work for a company and because of the interest rates and those types of things uh you're and maybe to a degree in some cases here with manufacturing companies or working for Coke or those types of things. It's just like you get a job 20 years, you have enough money in your retirement. Uh, you could send kids to school, your house would be Florida. paid off, that type of stuff, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, Yuval Hariri has been like a huge uh, uh, influence on me there where you know, when you look at biotechnology and information technology revolutions, um, we're not actually dealing with, say, like an unemployment crisis uh, as so much of, say, like just entire generation of humanity being considered irrelevant. And dealing with irrelevancy versus just having a job, I... I, I think that when picking a career, especially for this particular generation, it is really important to find something that gives you a sense of purpose. And uh, another book I've been reading or I just finished called Sweet Spot is uh, one of my uh, one of my favorite professors at Yale. Um, Paul, oh, gosh, let me get the Paul Bloom, Paul Bloom. And the reason why it's called Sweet Spot is there's just enough stuff. If you do not suffer your actual happiness goes really down because you don't really have that sense of purpose, but there's just a right amount of suffering that gives you a sense of purpose and meaning that when picking a career or uh, an adventure or a purpose as a startup founder, I, I think there's a certain amount of sweet spot suffering that gives you that, that meaning. Uh, but I think it's really 100% important. Now, my favorite book I always uh, recommend, Hard Thing About the Hard Things, yep. is Horowitz. that you have to manage your mind or that space between your ears because if that suffering hits beyond a breaking point, then you do have these deep psychological challenges that actually might not be worth it because of, say, the depression or um, if you're not well-equipped and you don't have the right um, support circle and the the mental strength to carry on, you know, you know, you could actually end up doing something bad to yourself. So I think, you know, what's important there, um, when picking a career in this new world that we live in, and guys, we're just scratching the surface. I mean, this whole Chat GPT revolution, all that. I'm telling you, if 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 governments are having a hard time catching up with technology and dealing with this irrelevance that the current generation is feeling, wait like one year Dude. as AI continues. Like the, the irrelevance factor yeah. of humanity continues to increase at an exponential rate every day that I think it is super important to find something that gives you just enough of suffering to give you that purpose to solve a particular problem yep. within the average 30,000 days that you have uh, to live on earth. And, you know, when, when thinking about that, uh, you know, actually starting a startup is actually something that could give you that sense of purpose, Absolutely. no matter how much suffering that you get. Um, I, I think though, and this is something that I just appreciate something that Rexy, it, it can't be thinking about and romanticizing the concept of, a, you know, a big exit, your nope. ball in. Nope. You know, I, I don't know, private jet, private island, 
you know, billionaire type thing. I think it's, you know, almost kind of related to maybe why, um, you know, the whole digital nomad, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, creating your own work, being, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that whole world of arbitraging or um, drop selling and those types of things is, yeah. I think it's freedom over money. Yes. Freedom over money. And so like when, when start thinking about the things, about the things that give you freedom, if you end up, you know, working on a startup adventure that mm. has no pathway. So like if a startup is, what's the pathway to the profitability? I think for a startup founder, it's like, what is that pathway to freedom? Mm. Correct. That's like, that you have to remind yourself. And I, I think when thinking about um, you know, that pathway to freedom, there's this particular study that has always impacted me. It's actually the the three unchanging core values mm. of me that anytime I'm in a dark place, I always remind my, you know, it's funny. I, I've, in previous interviews, I always call it, there's this Harvard study. I realized actually there is no Harvard study. <laughs> so I, I've never, I'm not going to say this Harvard study. I can't, I can't, because you know why? I can't okay, find Chad, it. I was, like, I was like looking for this Harvard study on happiness and I can't find it. So I'm like, you know, I'm not going to call it Harvard study. study of happiness. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and right. it's, it's, <laughs> so it's these three things, right? It's one, um, uh, a commitment to self-growth, just always trying to grow, be a better person every day. And the reason why I always bring that up is because this folly that um, we always tend to compare ourselves to something. Yeah. And the worst thing for an entrepreneur or the worst thing for someone with the particular insecurity of comparing is you're going to compare yourself to something better than you. Yes. So if you're going to compare yourself, you might as well compare yourself to the best version of yourself and use that as your barometer to inspire you to become a better person each and every day. So that's core value number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is less uh, on a relationship perspective is deep interpersonal relationships over a wide superficial network of friends. So really keeping mm -hmm. your inner circle close. And then number three, um, helping other people. And so one thing why I always remind myself of those three particular core values that, um, you know, are important for my happiness. God, I wish I could say Harvard study, but it's not, it's not true. <laughs> um, is, uh, is, uh, now even to this day with the struggles that we're going through, like the example of the, the, the failing muscle, look at, let's just run, let's run it through the rubric. Um, is this particular adventure and challenge pushing me to be a better person? Yes, it actually is. Two, um, deep interpersonal relationships with your friends and family. It's the only thing that's keeping me mentally alive right now, right? Yeah. Arm is my inner circle. Yeah. And number three, helping other people. And that was actually one of the hardest ones I had to deal with because yes, I had to remind myself that I am helping other people because the people on our platform are getting a lot of value out of it. We're still employing people. Um, and we're having a positive impact on the Philippines. But what's also kept me alive uh, mentally is helping the people who have we have let go as well. So I, I think really, uh, you know, having those unchanging core values uh, is super important. And so to answer your question about picking, you know, uh, being a startup founder. Yeah, I, I, I recommend it if you're prepared for it. But if you're not, dude. This is brutal life. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's yeah. really brutal. I keep saying there are a lot also of easier ways and and Oof. some like yeah, maybe dude. just as fun ways right. to, to make to but make But I'll just money. chime in. Um <laughs> I, I always say it like my wife always asks me, why do you always like to work on your birthday? Mm. Mm. And it's simple. Doing startups, yeah, and especially I, I my doing podcasts as my startup is mm -hmm. a double win. Mm. I love doing this shit. Yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It makes me happy. Yeah. So if I'm gonna start my birthday, my a brand new start to my year, right? I'll do shit that makes me happy. Yeah. I love working. I love hustling. This is my happy place. And you're right. It's that that healthy amount of sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah healthy. And pain. <laughs> right. That you have to yeah. put yourself through because I get a kick out of every single time that I put in the work. Or help my team try to get something. And you're right. It's all about that freedom of control that this mm. is a path that I chose. Yeah. Nobody told me to like, hey, do this thing. This is a path that I chose. It's hella hard. But I chose this. Mm -hmm. 
So whether it's hella hard, I have nobody else yeah. to blame. Why are you hitting yourself? Right? <laughs> <laughs> but when it's good, my God, I can't. I, I, yeah. I, I, I pitch myself like, man, am I really doing this shit? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's fun. Yeah. yeah. I, I enjoy doing this. So to, to, to go back, I, I actually just go back. So if you talk about Ben Horowitz, Mark Andreessen um, published an article. I put this in the show notes and founders only at com. Before you create your startup, Create your passion first. What mm. can you do for the next 10, 10 years mm. or again, 10,000 hours, whatever you want to freaking that metric would be. That even if you didn't make money out of it, you're just super passionate or are you an expert in that field? Mm. Mm. Yes. Wow. Then yeah, find yeah, that's, a way that's a great... to turn that into a startup and make yeah. it that money. And, you know, because at the end of the day, you already have the heart for it. Because when mm. shit hits the fan, the same way you, we have all hit the had have that our our yeah. shit hit the fan. It, you'll re- when you pinch yourself and like, hey, why am I doing this again? Because it's fun. Yeah. And you guys, when you went through that process, like, hey, what wh- when when the why is deep? Mm. Because you just get a kick out of it, yeah. even if it's not fun. Yeah. At the end of the day, Gab, it's gonna be hella worth it. So I don't know what your startup is. We it's not gonna be your last appearance, by the way, Gab <laughs> Abit, premium member. If you want to be part of it, premium.hustleshare.com. <laughs> you get to get get to meet amazing founders like this in the flesh, nice. by the way. Right? Yeah. So, okay. Gab, thank you so much for, you. for being uh, here on Founders Only. Like I almost said Hustle Share Founders Only. All right. So, we're Founders Only. But when we come back, we will now get the brand new session. Our top five Filipino founders based on Roland and Rexy's. Hicks. Well, let's talk about that more after the break. Hey, hustlers. I know how difficult it is to do fundraising at the moment for any startup or any business. And especially given this market where investors are afraid to write any significant check that would help your startup either scale or extend your runway, your options are very, very limited. But don't worry. I think I found a solution that just might help you. So if you're seeking capital for your Sari Sari store, online business, restaurant, or startup, CCAP's got you with a 24-7 fast and easy online loan application process, minimal paperwork, and real-time updates. Say goodbye to long lines and long waits with CCAP, UBX Philippines' online lending marketplace for micro, small, and medium enterprises. Choose from a wide variety of loan products from 5,000 pesos up to 1 million pesos from trusted lenders. With CCAP, you can apply for a business loan that's tailored to your needs, whether it's for capital, production, operations, or expansion. And check this out. You can apply anytime, anywhere in the Philippines. So what are you waiting for? Sign up at www.ccap.ph. That's www.seekcap.ph and apply for a loan now. And we're back from the break. We are still with Roland and Rexy with an amazing uh, stretch again with our premium member, Mr. Gab Abbott. And by the way, he's no longer alone. There's two more that came through. <laughs> Yeah. So your airtime is going to be limited <laughs> with this. But again, before we do our top five, where we will be talking about Roland and Rexy picking their top five founders in the Philippines. Doesn't have to be Filipino or Filipino founders overseas, up, up to them really. But the only difference later is that they can't pick me because Dexter, our very first guest, picked me. Like, what? <laughs> I know I'm not in the top five, but I appreciate you thinking me that way. Um, the second thing is, again, they can't pick themselves. They can pick your co-founder. But we will talk about that in a bit. One last question from our Hustle Share and Founders Only Premium Members. And his name is Mon Quindoza. Right? And he, he he's asking, number one, our, on hiring. What are your strategies on recruiting and employee retention, especially nowadays, you know, you know, you can't just be hiring mm. whatever talent out there. I uh, just put it into context of, you know, the the bull market. I mean, bear market that we're in. Um, any tips on hiring and employee retention, especially in a bear market? Hiring, I don't know. Do less of it. Uh, in, in our in our case, yeah, I think we hire too much. Um, uh. 
and again, like that was something that maybe we could have seen coming. Maybe it was it was the right move in a in a market where where everyone had infinite money, uh, yep. like all our competition had infinite money. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but I think there there's something to actually making the hiring uh, process a bit more thorough and painful than your comfort, um, yep. so that you have to have a high bar mm-hmm. for for who makes it through. Yep. Um, uh, and I remember there, it might have been Reed Hastings of Netflix who who said like you know, your first hundred hires you should be in like every single hire, uh, like every single uh, hiring should process. Cherry pick those because uh, you need to you need to be there to make sure that the culture, you know, the, the culture remains, that the culture yeah. survives, and if the culture evolves, it evolves in the direction that that you want it to evolve. Yeah. So that and then retention. I think for me, it's been more of just like being honest with people um, uh, and being transparent and and kind of like it, it's not, it's, I mean, with, with, the, you know, maybe there's certain things that you don't, you don't want to, if your organization is, is big enough, you don't want to like put out there and, and, and get leaked, right? But the, yep. Uh, I think despite that, there's still like more net net positives in in just like telling people exactly what the situation is as much as you can, um, and being aligned, uh, and also people who realize that it's not for them, mm-hmm. uh, knowing that it's not for them. Um, uh, yeah, got it. And the la- last question he asked is that how does Kumu ensure family friendly content? Don't get naked people, first of all. That's it. So no naked people <laughs> on Google. <laughs> but how do you guys do that? Because it's hard. Because these, these are, are all user-generated content. These mm-hmm. UGCs, right? How do you make sure that everything is, you know, above board? Yeah, I think we've, um, you know, this is something that we've tackled uh, from the very beginning. Is, and uh, especially when it comes to user-generated content is, you know, how you do content moderation. Yeah, And uh, that is the why community is so important Mm. because you know during the early stages when the community started forming and uh you know with james's help we had a a core value system safety number one okay positivity number two and acceptance uh number three and you know when you have enough of a critical mass of uh community Mm -hmm. actually going around those core values then the content moderation uh, people on the uh, platform numbers in the thousands, mm. and you know you have something like a you know a Facebook, which ironically hires thousands of Filipinos to do content moderation, where they you know mindlessly look through content and and, and ban it. Yep. But for us, you know, one of our underlying magics and the execution of actually making a safe place on the internet is relying on our community mm. that I think would be very similar to say like the way Wikipedia is completely moderated by yeah. its community or, mm. you know, Redditors to a degree, although it is kind of con- they toxic over there. But the thing is, <laughs> I think for us, it <laughs> is a really- a whole other jungle right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I was like, ah, Reddit's my, probably like a bad use case to a degree. But <laughs> yeah. I think Wikipedia is uh, something that's a lot more uh, aligned. And, uh, you know, the community is like super key. Because absolutely, uh, from a magnitude of a thousand, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we do have full time content. I mean, full time uh, content moderators uh, mm-hmm. that we call the Kumu Police, who or the uh, snitches, you know, yeah, they, they're, <laughs> they're uh, golden snitches. Yeah, they have. Uh, we have them broken up into brown guys, and they <laughs> have like hours where that they, um, you know, actually moderate the content. Yep. But it's the underground network you know if you're john wick fans it's like the you know the homeless people network yep it's like that mm, right nice. so it's like our content moderators the 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 kumu police are like the paid assassins right yep. but it's that homeless network <laughs> uh, on john wick is the secret All right, right? So, so don't got, offend the homeless network in kumu homeless yeah. network or asia if you're gonna get <laughs> yeah <laughs> Homeless yeah, because they're the ones who are snitching. I like you know the ones that are reporting <laughs> the bad content. All right, so now it's time for our founders only top five. You, these guys are getting getting nervous. It's like okay, so first and foremost, when we do yeah. the founders only top five, we're not here to say these are the top five officially. These are just yeah, again, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everybody's gonna make, miss the cut. 
Again, there's only yeah, two no, rules, absolutely. right? So again, this is just whatever. And they will explain who their top five Filipino founders or founders in the Philippines that they think. Um, there's only two rules. Number one, they cannot pick themselves. They can pick their co-founder. And number two, they cannot pick me because Dexter Lee got Gordon. Pick me. I don't believe that, but I appreciate him <laughs> picking me. But nah, I don't want this because most most people will be like, yo, you're one of my top five. Like, I don't want to boost my ego and all of a sudden, I'll walk around startup events. I'm See, a this, top five founder. This way like, you get to bring it up every episode. It's like, <laughs> someone, you didn't make his top five. <laughs> but okay, so let's funny. take our third pick, first pick. All right, Rexy. Roland Ross. Okay, Roland oh. Ross. Oh, wow, that's an easy pick. Hey. But, but why? <laughs> Thanks, man. I mean, I think I think just in terms of being able to, I think that the 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 vision and magnetism uh, that mm. kind of galvanizes people to want to be a part of building this a thing, um, uh, having that, but still also having um, kind of this lack of ego uh, mm. to to make people feel like they're you know they're they're on the same table um, yep. and and co-creating uh, is something that. I think I, I haven't met anyone else. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I still remember when I asked Roland what his hustle was in his Hustle Share episode, which by the way, if you want to check it out, it's going to be in the description box. And again, if you're no, lo not, no longer, <laughs> if you're not yet subscribed, and we're on YouTube now, so like, comment, and subscribe if you have any questions for any future founders. Comment. I forget. I constantly forget. I'm no, I'm, we're on YouTube now, so shit, I have to look at this freaking camera because, <laughs> um, Back in normal podcast, I can look anywhere and we're good, <laughs> right? But okay, um, going back to what Roland's saying um, during his hustle, hustle Share episode, his inaugural, he said, I asked him the million dollar question, Roland, what's your hustle? He's the only dude I've ever had. It's like, my hustle is the Philippines. Mm. Like, huh? What do we have it is the Philippines? And he explained it. Mm. Like, he really wants to freaking pay it for it. And dude, he's, he's, he said that in 2019. We're in 2023 now as we're recording this. And, mm. It just kept getting better. So, mad props. Good yeah. pick, Roland Ross. So, okay. All okay, right, you, Roland, who's your first pick? That's so great. Yeah, you know, I can't stop thinking about, um, you know, what was said earlier. And, you know, picking a co-founder. Rexy is, is not top five. He is my favorite founder. And... Oh, now I remember why. Because he was talking about marriage, and I just thought, it was funny. <laughs> and you know, again, I, I don't know, it, that's you. Just share for that's you. You know, I, th I think maybe that is kind of a running joke about you know my inability to find a, a life partner. And I they think have a nickname, by the way, in in Kumu. It's called Roxy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think the ship name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe it's one of those things where uh, I'm just realizing this now is um, one of the reasons why this works. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working right now <laughs> in, in my personal life is I think Rexy's the most trustworthy person I've ever met wow. in my entire life. Wow. Just trustworthy. And I said, wow, I'm just realizing this right now in terms of my own personal life is uh, trust. <laughs> So important in a relationship. <laughs> no, okay, so sorry. I just are you always th bad? Do you know what th is? No, no. That's tamang hinala. You're always uh paranoid oh yeah no no yeah i don't <laughs> yeah. really struggle with that part i think it's uh you know maybe it's me that has to be trusted. Yeah, the thing is, <laughs> but except no, with drexy no, no. you're not the I, I, you know mm. I, I think that's um it's it's because imagine you know rexy was talking about um being equal right mm. and so what's really interesting about two people who have equal execution and complement each other, yep. then you actually have multiple strengths. Yep. You know, uh, in the early stages of Kumu, we still talk about this whole concept of an Avenger story and those types of things. So it's kind of like you have that kind of, uh, you know, uh, like a Tony Stark, Captain America mm -hmm. type of situation mm -hmm. where you, if you look and think about, you know, what Tony Stark and Captain America bring to the table, whether it's through leadership, resources, intelligence, um, you know, risk taking and those types of things, you start realizing, um, you know, wow, you're when the two are together, it is literally like a two headed monster. Yep. Uh, and so from a level of trust, going back to that, I, I just, I don't know how, yeah, I, 
yeah. He's the most trust. He's literally the most trustworthy person I know. Ride or die. So mm -hmm. that's the thing is just like, you know, I, I actually, it's kind of funny. I, we have this really interesting dynamic, huh, Rexy? Like, um, we, we can just kind of go off and do whatever. <laughs> and there's literally zero. And that's the thing I always get shocked about too when I'm like, when we're advising, you know, uh, startups uh, or, you know, they're asking for advice and yeah. the level of like distrust or crap talking they have about their co-founder, I'm like shocked by it because it doesn't make any sense to me. Because uh, maybe that's how I just really lucked out when I first met Rexy and he he had started on this mission. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyways, yeah. I, I just, amazing. yeah. Yeah. All right, that, that was an easy pick. Now it gets difficult yeah. from here. <laughs> All right, so again, you pick Roland. Yeah, you pick Rexy. Rexy, who's your second pick? This is. I mean, I'll take the easy, another easy one. Uh, Melanie Perkins. Canva. Melanie oh. Perkins. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Easy pick. I guess why? I'll go with Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! Kidding. 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 Right, but well, uh, well, oh, why? Yeah. Wow. I mean, just you know, a product that yeah. uh, makes. True. It easier for people to create around the world in a yep. way that also makes money. Can you imagine profitable. a world it's without like Canva? Freaking, I yeah, can't, yeah. No, I was just using can't. Canva like yeah. yesterday. All my so. hustle share episodes back then. <laughs> all my episode <laughs> arts. That's all Canva. Yeah, that's amazing. All right, that was a that was a solid pick. Roland, who's who's your second pick? Man, um, you know, like the way Kobe looked at Michael mm. Dotto. Mm. Dotto. Manato. And I mean, I'm not where near even trying to say I'm comparing myself to him. I, it's more of an inspiration perspective. Yeah. It's like a true rags to riches story, by the way. That's exactly it. Yeah. Like you imagine coming from Cagayan, getting into Mapua, going to school, coming back. You know what I mean? Like that whole narrative yeah. was a very formative. I remember I, I shared this story uh, when I experienced my own exit mm -hmm. back in 2010. Uh, I was invited to go to this thing called Ayala Foundation that shifted and renamed itself Phil yep. Dev. And I saw him on stage talking about, you know, building the technology ecosystem at the Philippines. Yep. And a light hit. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I need to do, mm. you know? And yeah. I really do hope that someday there might be a po potential possibility of me fulfilling that role as like mm. the, the if if there's a Dotto maybe, or I mean, if there's a Michael and there's a Kobe, mm. uh, if I could somehow, you know, before I LeBron die, James. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, look at the best version of myself yeah. and be able to be in a position to bridge, uh, you know, US and Philippine yep. uh, entrepreneurs building to technology ecosystem. That's a, a complete dream of mine. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So again, if you also want to listen to the story of Dado Benatao, because of this guy, because you know, <laughs> I, right. I, I had I the remember. ball to so like reach out and he was my 100th episode. Oh, no on, way. On That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so check it out. Uh, it's going to be in the description box below. Below, it's going to be the hustle uh, behind Phil Dev with Dado and Maria Benatao. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. All right. Again, shout out to you because he had Dado is a key part also of his journey because he waited tables when during one of these things. <laughs> oh, no, and, yeah, it was my, the, right? yeah, the fundraising dinner. Yeah. My brother yeah. was the chef. Right. Exactly. And he was like, whoa, okay. That, that was my in. Like Roland told me to talk to you. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Rexy, who's your third pick? Third pick. Third pick. Um, I don't know them and I've been wanting to get to know them as well. I mean, better as, as founders. I actually don't think I've met them in person. Mm. Um, but uh, George and Angeline of Ancas. Oh, no yeah. way. You have Dude. not? I have not. I, I don't think I've met them in person like, at super. all. I will hook you up. They're our neighbors, uh, Rexy. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> we were supposed to, to do Oh, yeah. We were supposed to have dinner. They were, they were, they were yeah, George and, stuff, and but, Angie are going to be here soon. Yeah, they are. But just like in terms in terms of what they what they've built is, you know, um, from a from a brand perspective, mm. I think they've they've set it they've set solid tone in terms of like yeah. what kind of wow. uh, relationship a brand can have with with um you know the broader Filipino public. Yep. Uh, from a, like the hardships they've gone through Dude, perspective, sh with it get shut down several times, so many times, yeah. and so many existential yeah. uh, threats, yeah. uh, and having kind of gone through it and and be where they are now is is yeah, yeah. yeah it's huge. It's a huge inspiration. Easy, it's huge well, inspiration. Amazing. And again. And if they you inspire also, me every day. Every yeah. time I see an Ancas go by, they I just think of Georgian. Yeah, it's yeah. just so inspiring. They're uh what's this? What? 
what's the name of the guy? I, that's my oh Dante Gulapa. Yeah, that's my <laughs> internal dance for my wife. She never gets turned on. She's like, "What the hell are you doing?" But if you also want to again listen to the origin story of Angie and George, I've had them in 2019 as well. Wow, mm. yeah, um, amazing. So it's, again, it's also gonna be in the uh, wow. I, I, you know what makes me feel good? It's like oh shit, all these picks, just like also in Dexter's, yeah, have been guests on Hustle Share. Yeah, wow. perfect. All right, so Roland, third pick. Um. This is uh, actually a more recent one. I think oh. uh, Nina over at Colorette. Hmm. Have you guys? Oh, yes. No, I haven't. Nina, I've been asking you forever. Okay. You, she's just seen, so, seen zoning me. I've also no, never Nina met her. Is, I wanna... yeah. You know, the, the thing, she's just, uh, you know, I actually just met her for the first time recently uh, at a PayMongo uh, event. Yep. I think it was her anniversary. Mm -hmm. And Shout out PayMongo. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, one, there's this, uh, you know, narrative of, you know, having to be based in Metro Manila and, you know, yep. her being in Pampanga, yep. her personality. And I, I just think that's so cool to be able to build a multi-million dollar brand and not be in Metro Manila. And just like, uh, just, it's just so amazing uh, what she's been able to build. And, you know, I think uh, for this kind of recent crop of uh, entrepreneurs who have been out there, uh, I would say she's probably my favorite uh, entrepreneur right now. Just and again, ridiculous. the only one so far that's been picked that's not on house. So Nina, please come on. I got you. All right, I know your WhatsApp. We've been WhatsApping. She she just hasn't got back. I know she's just busy. Someday she will be on house of share and here on Founders Only. Rexy, your fourth pick. My wife's pretty cool. Nah. <laughs> oh yeah, yes. dude. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Best so, operator ever. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Killer operator. Best. Um, uh, just who? Wait. Who is your wife? Let's uh, let's uh, give flowers for uh, Michaela Beltran. Okay. Uh, so right now What's she's her, startup? Uh, her current startup is called Courtly, and it's still it's still very early. But they've gone from uh, in less than a year, uh, gone from zero to sizable revenues Ooh. and profitable, sizable like in, in a significant way. Wow. Um. Uh, creating this product that that allows people to get married from anywhere in the world online mm. um and get a utah marriage certificate uh from anywhere wow. in the world uh so so that's that's one where you just like the con your consistency and like executing on yep uh on a business um uh was always something that i think she'd, she'd done for other people's businesses in the past and she's nice. now kind of taking a a oh, step into I'll into have her on Hustle Share. You gotta hook me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, exchange sure. you, George and Angie, for your wife's interview. Yeah, there you go. All right, all right. <laughs> That's our next deal right there. Roland, your fourth pick. Probably uh, more Filipino than heart than some, mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. this particular entrepreneur's generosity of time, his his passion for the community, mm -hmm. and the fact that I think he actually is one of those people who actually successfully exited is Ron Hose. Mm -hmm. Right. He was a pick of Dexter's as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that Ron... Again, is... he's the only Ron that matters. That's why I go by Ronster. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I, I got, just got that. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> I'm Ronster. So yeah. Don't they say Ron? That's not me. That's yeah, Ron Hills. Just mm. his... his uh, he was there. I remember uh, even uh, pre, pre A, mm. he advised us on product. Uh, he's, um, you know, just his his... Uh, passion for community, you know, his leadership, um, his humility. I, I, I just, uh, you know, just Ron is just a, a, an amazing entrepreneur that, Amen. you know, I, I, I do hope that I could also have a positive impact like the way he's done. Like yep. he's just and super out. humble. Yeah. He's very, incredibly humble. He's just you know. now surfing somewhere for sure. Either <laughs> Chicago or La Union. But I just. Yeah. Uh, I have a uh, a Ron Ho story that I never can forget. And I've had him on the show, by the way, too. If you want to listen to the Ron Ho's episode, I, I had him literally after just he sold coins. Mm. Oh, wow. In 2019 early. Uh, also in the chatbot uh, office when when I interviewed you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But technically, we I, I threw a party in Geeks on the Beach in Cebu. Oh, okay. Right? He came through with, with all the, the guys. Then he walks out, his, his friend, Boe. Mm -hmm. We were in a club. Yeah. He removed the shoes to give it to his friend so that his friend can come in. Oh, wow. Just look at how selfless that guy is. Yeah. Amazing. Right? And it is super humble. Just just chill and 
no angas whatsoever. Mm. Right? Just, just I love him. Just, again, the only run that matters and it's not me. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Alright, last pick for you, Rexy. Uh, who's your fifth pick? Uh, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, That's another where people one. People make tampo to you now. It's like, please, please make me the tampo. kind of pick. Oh, I mean, the, the easy one, but I think symbolic is uh, 2010 Kak Tiong with mm. uh, Jollibee. Jollibee, right? Like oh, the, yeah, the dude. like the brand, the character, uh, the footprint, the global yep. footprint. Um, uh, not just global Filipino, but making moves in international markets. Yep. Um, like that is. I don't know, just, just one of those things that you like, it's so everyday and everywhere ubiquitous that uh, it's easy to to forget that that's, a, you know, the guy who built it is is around. Yep. Um, but someday, I will have, again, if you have, you have an in, I'd love to have him. I don't know, have, I don't have an in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big jolly, Lacking Jollibee, okay? Just a chicken joy and burger steak. Easy. But that that's always a solid, solid pick. All right. Last, but definitely not the least. Who's our fifth? And last pick for Roland. Uh, for this, this one is, um, you know, maybe a bit of a selfish one because, uh, you know, I've been kind of dabbling in, in angel investing, invested mm. in Lista. Mm. Mm. Uh, we invested in Podka. We invested in, um, what was the investor? Katarina. But this one in particular is, uh, I invested in a company. I remember just first meeting him in, mm. in uh, Single Origin. Mm. And he was saying he had a concept called uh, Pick Up Coffee. Boom. And I was like, this sounds super cool. I'm totally going to want to invest in this. Dude, Pick right? Up Coffee and, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so when I first met Diego, I, I think, you know, I got to say, um, when it comes to, you know, building a business, ironically, to the scale of like a uh, copy can on. Uh, mm. No, no, or no, no, we Starbucks. were just talking about a, like like a Jolly Bee, mm, yeah, or or even for Injap, you know, what he did mm. with Manganasal, like that's the kind of vibe in terms of where, uh, in terms of excellence in in communication. And they have good uh, fucking coffee, man. Yeah, it, that's Holy why shit. you know that's the thing I I really appreciate, just like textbook. Mm. He's like textbook, like perfect in terms of all those types. It's like, okay, from a product perspective, great product, right? As a CEO, you know, how are you allocating your capital? As a CEO, what is the right team where he already found that CEO, right? Mm, <laughs> like right. he put all the pieces together and uh, and that journey is just starting. Yep. Mm. And that's the thing that actually really this guy's excites hella young. Me. Yeah, I'm telling you. And Ooh. so it's just like, from a particular pedigree perspective, a lot of that F and B experience growing up in that environment to um, you know, uh the finance experience, it's just it's it's just packaged so perfectly that I, I would say that uh when it comes to favorite, I there's a lot of hope uh in in what um they're building. Mm, so absolutely. yeah. I would again, say he's my favorite. You can easily see it with the results. Yeah. Every single corner that you mm. look at there's pick up coffee and whatnot. Yeah. And yeah. again, the the results peak percent. Good investment right there too. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Offsets all our our, our fucking <laughs> blood blast bloodbath that we <laughs> that we experience. Yeah, but again, yeah. thank you so much guys. Thank you Roland and Rexy. Again, awesome, uh, this yeah. is not going to be the last for sure. Founders mm. only is not about hustle. So we can mm. always go back here. Yeah. Either both of you guys or we can have other guests and again, or probably Gab or the other yeah, yeah, share yeah, members yeah. and fa uh, founders only members talk about it. But again, thank you very much. Before I let you go, what's up next for, for Kumu and where should they look at? You guys are diversified mm. now, right? Um, what, what's, uh, what should people look out to? And again, where should they uh, check you guys out? And um, if they want to work with you, where do they go and how did they do that? Yeah, I mean, I think for for us, you know, when I think Roland had mentioned when we built when we started Kumu, the vision was not to build a live stream app. It actually, started with a messenger, mm. um, uh, and that was with this idea of this question of how do we build a platform for Filipino creators and communities. Yep. And so, so now we're starting to like lay the seeds of what does that look like in a deeper and broader way. Yep, um, deeper in the sense of like. The, the talents that are coming from Kumu, how do we support them more deeply in their careers? Uh, the ones who have potential to break out, uh, the ones who have uh, potential to earn in ways outside of virtual gifting, outside of live streaming. 
Um, and then broader in the sense of, you know, what's, what's the rest of the Filipino creative ecosystem where, um, Kumu can build a foothold that they can pay off in the long run. Yep. Uh, and that's where we're looking at things like, uh, games, comics, web novels. Uh, so, mm. uh, you know, we have this, these new apps, uh, Ube is our virtual hangout platform. Um, <laughs> Pen Lab is our local comics. It's the, it's the top local comics platform. Yep. Um, and Type Kita is a recent joint venture, uh, that we did with a Thai company that has this great chat fiction, um, app. Uh, nice. and the latter two, I think are, you know, trying to, we're trying to build relationships with the next great Filipino stories earlier on, uh, so that we can, when they get to the place where we need talents for, for a film or a TV show or an adaptation, yep. um, or even, a even an audio drama adaptation, like we, we can pull from our existing Kumu talent base to, yep. to push them. Um, yep. So, yeah, so yeah, just like coming up creatives, soon. any, you know, if you're a live streamer, if you're a gamer, if you're a comics creator, a writer, a yeah. artist, like there's a place for you in the Kumu ecosystem. Absolutely. And again, watch out. They have podcasts coming up soon. Oh, that's there true. Yeah. There you go. All right. Roland, uh, if they want to reach out to you, you've always been selfless in, in giving your time. Where do they go? How do you do that? Oh, how do they reach me? Yep. Actually, I've been... <laughs> I, I actually LinkedIn, uh, disabled LinkedIn. my Instagram, disabled my LinkedIn. Oh, you yeah. oh, so yeah. You can't <laughs> reach out. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. But yeah, uh, but yeah, no. But I, again, no, I, I think uh, I definitely <laughs> cool. do keep myself open. It's just that um, you know we've just been heads down, focused on execution. Absolutely. So yeah. So again, a pre now this is this has more weight. Just he actually came out mm. in the flesh to really. <laughs> Show us what's up. And again, Ray, yeah, I you notice I'm, I'm wearing a hat. It, like, <laughs> you know, the funniest thing is um, when you see a bald Chinese person with glasses and, and, and Makati, <laughs> you know, a lot of people just like assume it's me or something Ra like that. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, but the simple act of putting on a baseball cap, literally people are just walking right past me, uh, okay. which is super cool. I'll try uh, that. So yeah, because I've, I just look like an idiot. Earlier, uh, before I went here, I tried, I tried on a hat because I'm having this when you when you just uh, cut your hair, yeah, 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 you, yeah, you yeah. get sniffles. I was like, yeah. I'm gonna try a hat on, and I walked in, and my wife and I asked like, hey, how do I look? She didn't even say anything. She just slapped. She was like cracking up, and she, she couldn't. <laughs> like, okay, now I'm gonna. I'm a do rag guy. <laughs> no, I, I get but, you. I think my next step is. What if I walk out with uh, a do rag? I'm like, oh, holy shit! There's a there's a <laughs> right? Yeah, next so. is just uh, LASIK, and uh, I'll completely disappear. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So yeah. Oh man, you know you don't need a glass. It again, guys. Thank you so much for thank guesting you, on Founders Only. No, but before it. I let you guys follow us on whatever podcast app you're listening to, over Apple Podcast, uh, Spotify, and again, you're on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Again, if you like what you're seeing here. And again, if we did say some jargon, it's going to be the show notes on hustleshare.com. But for, to be to be specific on this podcast, it's going to be in foundersonly.hustleshare.com. And we and again, if you want to be part of the community, you can join our premium community on um, premium.hustleshare.com. Or you can join our founders only and hustleshare community on Facebook. Again, Roland and Rex A, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it, man. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace. Thank you so much for watching Hustle Share on YouTube. If you like this video, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel to get more content like this. And to get the full audio episodes of Hustle Share and Founders Only, subscribe to our podcasts at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.